And our final uh, presenter here is Alan Tolchin. He's an associate professor at Shippensburg University. Uh, yet again, as with our other panelists, very honored, um, many awards. Uh, but I would point, I would point everyone to his most recent, or one of his recent articles, uh, December of last year, AHA article on why the wars of religion lasted so long. You should check that out. Uh, Thank you so much. So uh, this is uh, my first foray into the 18th century. Uh, be nice. <laughs> Historians have long wanted to understand how the ideas of the philosophers were communicated to and understood by more ordinary people. This involves understanding the trade in books and periodicals. Books have been studied most famously by Robert Darnton. Newspapers have also received considerable attention from Jeremy Popkin, Jack Sensor, and others. Until recently, however, writing the history of 18th century newspapers presented a tremendous puzzle. Most of the articles were anonymous, and, age and editors plagiarized from each other promiscuously. Under these conditions, understanding the context in which editors chose which newspaper articles to print is difficult. This is particularly important because commonly, under censorship, writers have to use coded or evasive language, relying on readers to understand the context. Even apparently bland text can uh, have a sharp political point to those in the know. Without understanding who wrote anonymous material and where it came from, it's very hard to recover the context in which the material acquired meaning for contemporaries. With the digitization of enormous swaths of 18th century materials, however, much, has, much more has become possible in recent years. Uh, this project began when I happened to bring a cell band hotspot to the archives. Copying sentences from the articles in the Affiche de Bordeaux into Google led me to discover the surprising sources of its materials. Other scholars interested in identifying anonymous materials may want to know something about my methods. So the first thing to note is that Google Books, although it can be enormously helpful, has significant problems because the OCR uh, software it used is highly imperfect and the book's metadata is not always accurate. In order to mitigate these problems, it is helpful to do some of the following. First of all, select text for searching that contains as few special characters as possible. Try to avoid accents and the 18th century S in particular. Second, uh, it's hard to find, but go to the advanced search feature in Google Books, which is uh, books.google.com slash advanced book search. Restrict the search for titles in French and to a fairly, band, a fairly narrow band of years at any one time. I have had innumerable experiences searching for a text from the years 1700 to 1760 and getting nothing. Well, then you get a hit, perfect, for the years, say, 1755 to 1760. Go figure. It's helpful, at least initially, to restrict the, the search to books with full view only. But if that doesn't work, we do the search without that restriction because many uh, out of copyright editions have inaccurate metadata. So you think that you're looking for, you know that you're looking for a book from 1758, but the machine, because the metadata is wrong, thinks it's from 1928 or something. <laughs> um, what happens if you have those wrong uh, dates is that Google thinks they're still governed by copyright and therefore makes them available only in snippet view. Obviously, you also want to supplement with other digital sources, Galica, Hattie Trust, things like that. Uh, finally, for newspapers, uh, the uh, standard reference, which had been a print edition, Cigar's uh, Dictionnaire des Journaux, has now been put online. And that's enormously helpful because it now has links to online versions of all the newspapers. Mm. If they know that a particular newspaper has been digitized, they put in a link. Uh, even if you, a general search won't get you there, if you have a strong suspicion that a particular article comes from a particular other periodical, doing a search there will frequently get it for you. I hope this doesn't sound too daunting, and I admit it can be frustrating, but I really have been amazed. 
I've often gotten results in seconds, and I frequently, uh, I normally can find the source for any article in the Bordeaux affiche in under a half hour. Uh, sometimes it's possible to trace long trains of transmission over many years as texts circulate from periodical to periodical. Anonymous news was a great cover, since, of course, uh, officially, uh, the distribution of news in France under the old regime was restricted. The monarchy explained the news to the reading public via the Gazette de France. Other publications were not supposed to provide hard news. Beginning at mid-century, the advertisements in the Gazette, with a light sauce of articles to encourage readership, was rerouted to a new publication, the Affiche de Paris. Those proved highly profitable and encouraged provincial imitators who were able to get permission from local authorities to uh, print things like the Affiche de Normandie, de Lyon, and so forth. A genre was born. The provincial affiche blossomed dramatically in the 1770s and 80s, and by the end of the old regime, 44 towns had one, Paris had two, um, one of which was intended for a nationwide, uh, therefore essentially provincial audience. They're usually published weekly, sometimes more often. Annual subscriptions are between six and seven and a half livres, depending on the locality. So the Bordeaux affiche was one of the very first of the provincial affiche, founded by the brothers Jacques and Antoine Labotière in 1758. Subscription cost six livres. Although it's impossible to get precise circulation figures, these were not highly elite publications. It's reasonable to guess that they were highly read with, uh, within the urban milieu. Beggars and cobblers might even have glanced at someone else's uh, copy, especially if they were looking for employment, since many of the ads were job postings. Many merchants and negociants of Bordeaux surely read it with attention. The Bordeaux fiche of four pages long usually only carried one or two articles. In the later 1760s, the space devoted to ads tended to increase at the expense of editorial content, uh, but as in other provincial towns, the news hole was never very large. But because of disputes between the Intendant and the Jura, censorship in Bordeaux was very weak, and there is no evidence that the local authorities ever clamped down on the affiche. Previous studies of the Affiche de Bordeaux and other affiches in late 18th century France have stressed that they were fundamentally conservative and risk averse. They don't want to talk too much about politics or religion or the philosophes. They extol the monarch and generally criticize Voltaire on the rare occasions they deem to mention him. So uh, Jack Sensor in his standard survey comments, for the most part, whatever the occasion, these papers supported monarchical power without question and the ecclesiastical authority related to it. They ignored the philosophes. On the rare occasions they were mentioned, they were generally condemned. So uh, Sensor here is endorsing the classic account of Daniel Mornay, who concluded that the provincial feast as a genre, quote, almost never discussed philosophy. Even more than in Paris, the editors used extreme prudence. In the early years of the Affiche de Bordeaux, however, quite the opposite was true. The Affiche regularly covered all sorts of supposedly forbidden subjects, including detailed military and political news. They regularly and consistently praised philosophes by name, and they published banned literature. Even anodyne sounding pieces were sometimes extracts from banned works. The articles in the Affiche de Bordeaux were frequently copied from other newspapers, especially the Mercure de France, which is the most pro-philosophe French paper, but also illegal foreign papers. Some of its articles were of a relatively conservative cast. I'm currently compiling a database of all the articles, and when I'm done, I'll have a statistical evidence on this, but just from reading through the issues, the percentage of explicitly conservative articles is really very small. The affiche permitted a wide 18th century public in Bordeaux to get easy access to Enlightenment ideas. The affiche, despite the conclusions of Mornay and Censor, regularly mentioned the philosophes, sometimes indirectly, but also frequently by name, invariably in positive terms. A piece borrowed from the Mercure attacked their enemies. Ridicule has been attached to the name of philosophe. Surely it is to have a pretext to be exempted from being one or to take revenge on the lessons of philosophy. These insulting petty attacks showed that the philosophes' opponents could not answer their arguments. A theater review praises the toleration preached by Voltaire's Mahomet. 
quote, on the 12th, Mahomet was performed. It is one of the masterpieces of the Sophocles of our century. What strength, what color. This tragedy forcefully uh, depicts the horror of superstition and fanaticism. Note that the praise was mu as much the message of toleration as of the poetry of Voltaire's language. And another article cites Voltaire's Epitre sur l'envie, approvingly giving the title and the author's name. In the theater reviews in particular, Voltaire's praise really had no bounds. The anonymous reviewer commented that almost all authors begin with works of modest power, but, quote, Monsieur Voltaire alone began with a masterpiece. At 19, he gave us Edip. In the same issue, the reviewer comments, on the 9th, Azir, a tragedy by Monsieur de Voltaire, was performed. This piece, entirely invented, would alone be capable of assuring immortality to its author. Its poetic enthusiasm is sustained with the most masculine and vivid colors. Its humanity and greatness of soul triumph. The very next week, the reviewer recounted an anecdote about Ninon de L'Enclou, the celebrated wit and beauty. Quote, in the last years of her life, Monsieur de Voltaire, still a child, visited her. She examined him with a particular attention and appeared to perceive in the lively and ingenious responses that he gave her, the prodigious talents which impelled him to be lifted eventually to the rank of one of the first geniuses of our century. The affiche also published an, ex, uh, an, ex, an extrait d'une lettre de Monsieur de Voltaire, criticizing those who create offices and taxes, Presumably, the editors of the affiche were well aware that only some of Voltaire's works were legally publishable. Otherwise, they would not have published his Memnon anonymously. Talk about that in a minute. But I did not find a single negative reference to him. The theater reviews are particularly noteworthy since those were written uh, in, in, in Bordeaux, as opposed to copied. Obviously, the words of one local theater reviewer don't uh, represent the unanimous views of the local community, but they are typical of the affiche de Bordeaux, which suggests that its editors shared these views and likely that they expected most of their readers to do so as well. At the conclusion of the Seven Years' War in early 63, 1763, the Bordeaux affiche published a poem, a bard here again from the Mercure, in praise of peace. But its praise of Louis XV is qualified and the poem rapidly becomes a hymn to the Enlightenment. I'll give it in translation. Singer in praise of the great Henri, of whom the immortal muse shall so many times praise the beautiful name of Louis. For this adored prince, revive all your zeal. Recall your beautiful days. Have they vanished? No. Voltaire is still the true god of genius. He has the same fire and the same talents. He is the darling of the beautiful Urania. I hear with transports his sublime accents. It is for him to mark the rank and place of heroes whom he will again paint the virtues. Others at his choice will be graced by his brush. Louis, for the French, will always be Titus. That last line is actually praise of the king. It's borrowing from another quote of Voltaire's uh, that's in, quoted in the Encyclopédie. Uh, Voltaire said uh, that Having conquered Jerusalem and knocked down its walls did not make Titus's name eternal. He was beloved, that was his true greatness. Uh, still, uh, the earlier lines make it clear that whatever Louis XV's merits may be, Voltaire is the one who decides how the future will view him. He is the true god of genius, more powerful over posterity than any mere king. The poem ends by singing the praises of trade, the arts, and the useful sciences, which peace will now permit to flourish. So even a poem ostensibly uh, praising the crown focused on, pre on praising peace, the useful sciences, and Voltaire. The Bordeaux affiche also printed material that preached that all men were created equal and that political decisions should be made on the basis of the general will. That's where Memnon comes back in. So uh, the original edition of Memnon is 1748. There are some subsequent revisions. As far as I can tell, this is the first publication of the story in an officially approved French edition. The others have fake title pages, you know, the usual Langres, uh, Dresde, uh, and so forth. A year later, there is a verse adaptation which was published in the Mercure, retitled Demo. So it seems likely that Voltaire's name was omitted to make publication easier. Uh, surely putting it in would have uh, helped sales if it were legal to do so. 
Part of the story describes an ideal world located on a planet circling the star Sirius where rulers, quote, never do an injustice because our little, on our little star, star, everyone is equal. Another essay published in the Affiche demonstrated a clear sense of the public sphere in which the good of the nation could be discussed. Quote, I don't know, but I don't know what spirit moves over the face of the abyss from all these separate bodies of these states of these republics divided in their ideas and their sentiments arise a general sentiment which brings everything back to the just and invariable ideas of justice, unquote. Thus the ideal society was a republic where everyone was equal and decisions were made on the basis of justice as determined by the general sentiments of the population. This is the affiche. Intolerance also came in for more uh, serious criticism. As Colin Jones has noted, the affiche pointedly advertised a set of engravings depicting one of the most notorious examples of religious intolerance in the, the period, the execution of Jean Calas, Protestant merchant uh, for the supposed murder of his son. Uh, the ad states that the image, quote, will show six portraits which will precisely resemble the widow Calas, her two daughters and her son, uh, Monsieur Laves and the honest ser servant girl who for having been faithful to innocence and to truth c courageously shared all of the disgrace of her employers. Uh, it's pretty clear I think from the description the point of view of the uh, uh, engravings. Voltaire wasn't the only philosopher mentioned in the affiche. D'Alembert was also singled out for praise. The affiche published a letter to him by the Empress Catherine the Great urging him to leave France to become her son's tutor. In it, the Empress wrote, I know that the cause of your reluctance is only the love of ease to cultivate letters and friendship, but what holds you back? Come with all your friends. I promise to you and to them also all pleasures and conveniences that I can provide, and perhaps you will find more freedom and rest than at home. Readers could have hardly fail to note the implication that Russia enjoyed greater freedom of thought than France. Russia also apparently uh, showered philosophers with honor in cash. The affiche were even willing to cover one of the great scandals of the 18th century over uh, Helvetius' De l'Esprit, uh, published anonymous in 1758. De l'Esprit praised the censorship, uh, excuse me, De l'Esprit passed the censorship. The censor was not well versed in philosophy and appeared with a royal privilege. Once the book appeared, its enemies denounced it for advocating atheism and materialism, and amidst enormous outcry, it was put on the index. The censor was dismissed, but Helvetius, after making several retractions, survived. The first uh, retraction, which the scholar D.W. Smith calls an astonished justification, was published in the Affiche de Bordeaux. The later retractions, which are much more groveling, they don't put in. Um, the, uh, so here is a bit of that uh, first retraction. I have been led by my subject to consider what were the wellsprings that moved the political and moral world. The history of different nations and the compilation of facts led me naturally to ascribe to the passions, the vices, and the virtues, both the great and the criminal acts. But as I was considering humanity in general and society in a primitive state, I thought to determine more generally the human means to make humanity happy in the world. I had to ignore supernatural motives and only speak about motives which might be suitable for all peoples and to all legislators, uh, legislators irrespective of their religion. It was necessary, therefore, to seek a source able to achieve the temporal good of society and applicable to all constitutions of government and all religions. I believed I found the spring in the passions and my plan was to indicate the means of directing them toward the general good and to make them serve to lead men to virtue. So although at the end of this, uh, Helvetius declares that he intends no harm to religion, this is hardly a retraction of his views. In fact, it's closer to a summary and restatement. He was deliberately attempting to create neutral principles that could be used to critique all nations and systems of belief. And furthermore, his goal was to make people happy in this world rather than to assure their salvation in the next. Despite his shallow disclaimers, he had proposed a set of axioms above and beyond the reach of Christianity. Contemporaries agreed, and that's why he had to make further retractions. 
whether or not the omission of the subsequent uh, retractions was deliberate, it, the result is that readers in Bordeaux were given a summary of Helvetius's views without much dilution. Not content with attacking Helvetius, conservative forces moved to attack other authors in their works. This led directly to the banning of the Encyclopédie. Uh, its privilege was revoked on March 8, 1759 probably also was a way to attack Pompadour and her supporters. Uh, on the 12th of June, 1760, the Affiche published a coded account of the affair in the form of a lettre from Paris uh, dated the 24th of May. It noted that there has been a general revolution in Paris. Instead of reviewing the troops, now it's encyclopedists who are under inspection, and everything that smells of the encyclopedia is routed. Rousseau, who they call the philosoph of Geneva, rather than by calling him by his name, now has to hide from the woods from shame instead of by preference. For the writer, all of this is silly. All of this is the work of a comedy, the letter says. Why waste time in attacking the encyclopedie when, after all, France is engaged in a real war against a real enemy, England, you know? Perhaps the philosophes were silly, but they were in no real sense dangerous, and their enemies were therefore ridiculous to attack them. The uh, affiche was not done with the encyclopedie. The remaining volumes eventually appeared in 1765, published under a false imprint. But over the course of eight weeks, from the 6th of January through the 10th of March, 1763, the affiche de Bordeaux published a long Dissertation analysée sur le mot éducation, which was nothing less than the article Education lifted word for word from the Encyclopédie. Although the affiche did not explain where it came from, and the text itself is in no sense subversive, publishing was a pretty clear indication of what the editors of the affiche thought of the ban. Arguably, at least some readers were also in the know about what this, what this article was. In many other towns, the affiches were undoubtedly conservative publications, but in Bordeaux, there is more interest in the affiche than just the ads. The affiche did not directly attack Louis XV, but it did say that his future reputation would depend on what Voltaire concluded about him. Articles in the affiche also asserted that distinctions of rank were insignificant, that everyone was equal, that monarchs were at best an ambiguous good, and that the majority of the public, if consulted, would adopt correct policies. Though the officious attacks on the church were limited, it advocated religious toleration. Uh, this is a particularly important issue in Bordeaux since the city included significant Protestant and Jewish minorities. The affiche gave di extensive positive coverage to major philosophers, including Voltaire, D'Alembert, Helvetius. As far as I can tell, uh, no previous scholar has reported that articles from the Encyclopedia were reprinted in any uh, Parisian or provincial affiche uh, before it was uh, banned or afterwards. They gave Rousseau less attention, but the few coded references to him suggest that the editors expected readers to know who he was and some of his basic intellectual positions. It seems highly likely that the editors of the affiche knew they were in dangerous territory, given that they, lift, they printed some of Voltaire's stuff without his name attached. In short, Based on the content of the affiche, the Labotiel brothers favored the Enlightenment and were in favor of religious toleration, which made sense in the context of a multi-confessional city. Surely they were not conscious revolutionaries aiming to radicalize the public. Rather, the affiche expressed the ambient ideas and local public sentiment, uh, sort of like an 18th century reader's digest. Its contents also give a sense of the cultural literacy expected of its readers and their aspirations to high culture. The coded qualities of some of the Affiches articles suggest that a relatively wide public in Bordeaux was interested in and aware of major intellectual and political developments. While the price of the Affiche was higher than today's sources of classified ads, it appealed to a much broader uh, public than classic Enlightenment works or even most other newspapers. Some of the articles would have been hard to understand unless the readership had read or had, had read to them articles in other illegal publications. By spreading Enlightenment ideas, the Affiche de Bordeaux helped encourage an intellectual revolution before the political revolution. It presented a new set of fundamental beliefs. Thank you. <laughs>